Today on Broadcast, if you're finding yourself asking what's next in your life, you're going to want to listen to this show. Don't you think, Kim? I do indeedy. <laughs> Definitely check it out. You are very inappropriate. I like being inappropriate. Broadcast is entertaining. Come on, if I can't mess with you, this is not going to be fun. Broadcast is thought-provoking. That is a riveting revelation, Ms. Goldman. Broadcast is unexpected. Who do you like better, the person that people think you are or the actual you? Oh, God. Because they're nothing alike. Broad topics, broad minds, broad hosts, but not just for broads. We are man-friendly. I, I hope to be. I am man-friendly. I can't say the same about Kim. Wait, that sounded bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is Broadcast with Kim Goldman and Jackie McDougal. Welcome to Broadcast. Well, uh, 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 uh. That laugh is hilarious. I was just about to say that was that that open was done at a time where we used to laugh at our own jokes a lot more. We were also drunk. <laughs> See, I'm actually laughing at your joke, um, and it's quite possible that we were. So, uh, welcome to the show. I'm happy to, to be here. I'm happy to be here too. <laughs> Today's broadcast is brought to you by our latest obsession ebates.com oh i did it i did the ebates i know you did and i was so proud yeah. seriously like go over to our website um broadcast.com and we have a lovely little post about ebates um but you can shop at anywhere you want where did you shop yesterday oh target target and what did you buy i bought a water feature for my walkway it's the fourth one because i can't seem to well because the hoa is always ticked off at you i know <laughs> so you you went over to ebates I and did. I, Target. I did. I clicked the link from our page uh, because that's what you told me to do. Yes. Um, and then somehow it brought me into Ebates and then mm -hmm. I just went shopping. And I really did want to spend a lot more time on there. Um, but I do have a job. And, oh, um, so, a job. Uh, I have to, I had to work. But I, I really, yeah. I, I wanted that. It's cool, right? And the other thing, like people don't think... I mean, first of all, who okay, well, let's go back up. So there's no, there's no sign up. There's no monthly thing. No, it's there's free. No, it's totally yeah, free. You just sign in to your you account and you shop and right. then you just get money back. I mean, right. it's like no brainer. So like if you go, um, I would never shop at Kohl's without a coupon. I just find that would be a weird thing to do. Um, I'm just not one of those people. And so, but you could go to Ebates, find Kohl's, go to Kohl's, use your 30% off coupon and still get cash back from Ebates. In the store? No, no, no. Oh. Online. Oh, online. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah. you can use coupon codes online and stuff. Right. So it's pretty crazy. Like Amazon, same thing. Oh. Um, so you go through eBay to click on Amazon, you buy your stuff. I, I have said this before, but I love Expedia, um, which we're not getting paid from Expedia, just so you know, to, uh, to say this. Just no, but I do love them. <laughs> so I go to Ebates first, oh. click on their Expedia link, get a great price, but then I also get cash back from Ebates. Oh. I know. Look at you working the system. I know. I I'm thought amazing. I was the only frugal beagle in the world <laughs> the frugal beagle the frugal beagle I'll get that url right now um but the cool thing is like can i get you could, it through ebates you could <laughs> you can't actually maybe um <sighs> but you could like also do groupon you know how people love groupon you could go through ebates find groupon coupons and coupon codes and then go See, this there. would be a much better intro if we were drunk right e groupon coupons, coupons. Group on coupon. uh, yeah. but like so if you go to uh i'm on there right now 50 percent off things to do for new Groupon customers, plus 6% cash back. Oh, that's crazy. You're on it, you woman. Spend, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I like it. It's all good. Back like to school, fashion, beauty. Anyway. It's fantastic. Who um, doesn't like to save money and earn money while they shop? We're obsessed. And I know it's a sponsor, but I really get a little bit excited about eBay's because <laughs> it's really cool. So anyway, <laughs> back to the show. Welcome. 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 I'm excited about today's show. Um, I am too. Because we're going to talk to Jenny Blake, who is a podcaster, and Ooh. you know how much we love podcasters. Uh, and she's also, her book is coming out September 6th called Pivot. Okay. <laughs> I had to do that for you. <laughs> because oh my God. for the last several years, Kim and I, like every time the word pivot comes up, you have to do Ross from Friends. I know, pivot. <laughs> so. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate so that. So I pivot. Okay, so there are certain things that remind me um, of shows I've seen or songs. So like every time I hear the word bucket, mm. I always have to say Dear Liza because when I grew up, it was the song, There's a Hole in the Bucket, Dear Liza, oh. Dear Liza. So now That's I have my funny. son doing it. So wherever we are in the world, when we hear bucket, we just say Dear Liza. And I'm the only one that's doing it. Right. So then when I hear um, pivot in my head, I'm hearing pivot. pivot. 
And then I hear Joshua. Oh, I Joshua. Hear Joshua of Joshua. friends. Yeah. Yes. And so, so many friends. So many friends things. And I feel like I'm the only one doing this. No. So I love that I found this in you. That see, it's, it's synergy. Um, I can't even hear the name Sheldon without going back to when Harry met Sally and going, ride me, big Sheldon. Oh, like, I don't it's know ridiculous. that one. Yeah. Oh. You know, remember who he's like, Sheldon I, does your taxes, you know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's another yeah. one too that I that always comes to mind that is is blank I'm blanking right now but friends constantly well I do uh, when people say um, it's interesting I'm like it just got interesting like (laughs) and I can see the episode in my head and you know what it's it's bad I I don't know what that says about me it's the only thing I can remember I I can't remember to eat or go to the bathroom but I can remember quotes from totally and Seinfeld Uh so I want to know uh well we want to know I assume I don't want to speak for you but what are some movies and tv shows and even songs that you have to at least say it in your head when you hear it. So just like if I hear a 70s or 80s song, yeah. and if that song was in like a KTEL commercial, remember those old KTEL records? Yeah. Where they would have a collection of songs from different artists? Oh, yeah. I When that song goes, I have to start singing the next song from that oh, commercial. Like right. that's where my brain goes. Right. I have to, I can't remember really to pack good. my kids' lunch, yeah. but um, I yeah, can remember that. So I my son started, um, we watched uh, 16 Candles. Oh yeah, because now he's at the What's age. What's happening, hot stuff? That's that's what we say. That one and <laughs> leg, big leg. Yeah. So <laughs> now my son, like, it's hilarious. What's now the other my, one? Uh, Maddie, Maddie. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm not doing the accent very well, so I apologize for that. Yeah. Long duck dong. But don't don't send her emails. She's just trying to quote. Her I was movie. trying to be funny. <laughs> it's part of the. Hey, you know what? It's better than um, who is the is it Tim Kaine that tried? Was it Tim Kaine? Is that is that our vice president? Oh yeah. Comedy? And he tried to do his Donald Trump impersonation, which was terrible. Do you remember oh, during the DNC? That's funny. Just me. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll just sit over here. It was so bad. <laughs> nobody else knows about it. Yeah. Um. So I'm excited because Jenny's going to be on, and we're going to talk about pivot. That's where this all started. Um, and she's going to be on in a little bit. So, um, and I think it's really important because I think, and we could talk more about this with her, but I think that people now kind of are looking for their passions and looking for to do something in their life uh, and career that matters and that matters right. to them. And that really kind of, it, you know, the days of punching in a clock and sliding down the dinosaur and punching out and all that, you know. <laughs> Fred Flintstone reference. I got it. Um, you know, I think there are fewer people who are looking to do that, you know, and people right. are looking and there's so many opportunities out there for, you don't have to do what you don't want to do. Well, it's funny, uh, Denise, my best friend and I always talk about this. I get she, it. I'm not your best friend. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we used to talk about this a lot because she's very much like a clock in girl. I mean, she works really hard, but she said, you know, you, you don't have to love your career. And we used to argue about this mm. because I'm like, I don't want to spend, you know, that's a lot of hours. It's a lot of hours it. to not love what you do. And sometimes you're stuck in what you're doing and you can't necessarily get out. But um, I truly believe that in some way you have to find moments of, of appreciation and love and passion for what you're doing. Otherwise, it's just like snooze fest. Right. And it doesn't matter. It's not about like you have to be appreciating every single day. You know, like some days you just don't want to do it. And some yeah. days are harder than others. I mean, I'm sure you get yeah. that with kids and, and, you know, working with teenagers and and working with yeah. counselors who work with teenagers right. and working with me <laughs> can't right. possibly be that's why as tu- enjoyable that's as I would why, think. That's why I tune into um, bachelor and bachelor in paradise. And, you know, I just zone out of my life and watch somebody else's chaotic train wreck happen on those stupid shows. Yeah. Cause it makes me, because happy. it's like an escape. Yeah. Because I, my job is hard. I love what I do, but my job is hard. So I need to find another place, but right. s- moving aside from bachelor in paradise, have you been watching the, uh, um, the Olympics? I love the Olympics. Yeah. I love the Olympics. I hate the Olympics in the only sense that I think I know what's happening before it actually airs. Of course airs you know what's happening. Because I, I, I'm so frustrated. Yes. And I got people all worked up on my Facebook page because I think it should be, we, we get a calendar, we get a map of when things are happening. Just okay, go I live. I can't say map without hearing Dora. That's another one. Uh, I'm, I'm, the the map, map, I'm the map, map yeah. I'm the map, I'm the map. In tune though. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going back, 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 back. I do that in the morning too. It's Swiper, crazy. no swiping. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh man. <laughs> okay. We digress or is that the word? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Olympics, the Olympics, the you know, if we had a calendar, like, okay, I understand it's happening in Brazil. And so we don't necessarily have the ability to be up at three o'clock in the morning or whatever things are happening. Like, okay. But first of all, let's just get the U S on the same page. Because we all tune into the Oscars at a certain time or right. or you know, certain award shows in, in the World Series and things like that. Like, at, 
at the same time, why it's, they've got four years to plan, <laughs> you know, why right. can't we watch things at least in the U S at the same time? Well, we are, we're just all watching repeats of what already happened. But we're not because they're watching it primetime. And I get it. Primetime. I've worked in television a long time. Like yeah. they want the dollars, right? And so primetime brings that in. But I think, you know, you could you could run it twice. You could run it at five and you could run it at eight. I well, don't know. It's just not working for me. Well, they do rerun it. I. But what's happening is they're doing things because not everybody tunes in for fencing. And so like the fencing stuff, it's at different times. I mean, they, they air. I love that I can turn on, not always NBC, but I'll go to USA, Bravo, somewhere and find right. other events. Right. But by the time you get there, you already know who won. Like, but I, I feel I like the main events. Yeah. Last night before it aired and I was frustrated. It's the main events that are really like the swimming and the yeah. gymnastics and you know, it's like, it, it is, it's such a bummer to see it you know who's trending so I, I even though i knew that um simone this is spoiler alert uh simone <laughs> manuel won the gold i still was as shocked as she appeared when she actually won because my son was telling me that she won in the car and i tuned him out <laughs> and so uh when i was watching the race she was like she came out of nowhere in the i don't even know what it was was it the 100 it was a 100 meter freestyle Right, that she won? Is that what she I won? I just know it was an individ- okay, oh, individual. Okay, now you're going to make race. me click on this. Okay, no. um, but anyway. But so can we go won- back to the significance of Simone? <sighs> oh, look at you. Yes. All right, Kim, go. So <laughs> my son in the car was telling me that she was the first African-American woman to win, to medal in an individual race in the Olympics. Yes. And so again, I wasn't entirely listening to him. And so when the race was coming on and they kept talking, the announcers kept talking about the two Brit girls, sisters, then Abby Weitzel, who's from our hometown. Mm-hmm. They didn't really mention much about Simone Manuel. She was in like lane seven or whatever, or whatever mm. lane she was. I'm like, oh, maybe this is, I just didn't put it together. Right, and right. she was not winning for most of the race. And all of a sudden she came out of nowhere and she kicked ass and she won the gold. That's awesome. And then she tied. <laughs> She tied with the 15-year-old chick from Canada. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, she tied. They tied. For they tied for first? 58.7. Yeah, they tied How for gold. Tie? I mean, that is like... It was unbelievable. But when So when Simone, when she turned around to look at the clock and she saw that she won, it was like the most pure, authentic moment of joy. And then she tied. <laughs> So, but, but she still, was so gracious but, when but she, she still won. Got, and, they yeah. both got the gold. Then. Yeah, they both get the gold. But she she is the first African American woman to win um, in an individual swimming competition, and so that was that was pretty That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah, that so, is awesome. Yes, I do see the significance of her winning. <laughs> I know you know the yeah. significance. I just wanted to share yeah. it with her. All yeah. right, but I know. You, make me, you 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 take away my thunder. So, I'm so ADD. Um, Can can we quote her and what she said about this? Yes. This win hopefully brings hope and change to some of the issues that are going on. My color just comes with the territory. She said after tying for the gold in the women's 100 meter freestyle event, which makes you right. Yeah. Um, Which is awesome. Yeah. I just love the Olympics. I swear. I, you know, I, I cheer, I scream, I'm crying when the, when the parents are in the, like the best one is the, um, Allie, what is her last name from the, um, she won the silver in the gymnastics. Oh yeah. Yeah. what, what's yeah. her name? Allie Reisman. Uh, Reisman. Um, when her parents are in the stands <laughs> and they're leaning and dipping and flipping, you know, totally. it's so fun to watch them. Um, but, you know, I just, I, it's knowing, and this is not even a comparison, but knowing how hard my son trains for basketball. Yeah. And it's not even anywhere on the radar. Right. As compared to, in the Richter scale to what these young people do. Um, I'm just, I get so excited and I just, I'm so emotional mm. during the Olympics. I mean, I'm just a mess. Um, anyway, there they're not all young. There's a 41 year old uh, gymnast. Did you see her? Oh my god, I uh, love she, her. Yeah, where is she from? She, yeah, uh, is it Uzbekistan? I don't know. Um, but she's she's been all over the place. Um, for at, at different times, you know. So yeah. she has been. Um, she's actually competed for different countries. But it's awesome to see her when she was young and when she was older. Yeah. But um, we are going to go to our first guest. But before we do that, I just oh. want to say from yeah. one Simone to another. Um, Simone Biles, like when I grow up, I want to be her. Simone Biles, the Olympic gold the, winner. Yeah. See that? See that? <laughs> Olympic gold the winner. American gymnast. Yeah. But um, yesterday she announced, I'm not the next Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps. I'm the first Simone Biles. Aww. And I love that the Olympics, no matter how many golds are won or not won or, you know, is that our kids are watching this. Our yeah. kids are seeing other Americans like step up and 
kind of really get to know who they are right. and to work hard. And I just love it. I love when my kids watch it with well, me. And that they're shedding, you know, those, those, those titles and those, you know, categories and, you know, they're trying to just be their own person in this world that categorizes them so quickly and compares them. And, you know, I mean, they just, I, and I, they're I like, I that. will not be yeah. categorized. Yeah. I will not be put into this label. Like I'm not, I don't fit into the label just because you call me that. Right. Yay. Right. So if you're just it. listening to us, you're just tuning in. It's broadcast with Jackie McDougal and Kim Goldman. And we have an awesome guest. I on am our show very, today. very excited. We have Jenny Blake on the phone today. Um, she is the author of the upcoming book pivot yeah. and um, as well as the podcast pivot. Jenny, are you with us? I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks Good so much morning. for being on. Um, so I don't know if, if this happens to you, but Kim and I have this like friends obsession that we, so every time we say the name of your book, we have to go pivot. <laughs> do you think about Ross with the couch totally. around the corner? Yes, we do. And he's like, <laughs> we just played yes, the, we played the audio. <laughs> I cut oh, it off. I cut God. it off before, before Chandler's like, shut up, you know, but anyway, That's welcome awesome. to the show. Well, Thank you. Have you guys seen the Silicon Valley episode from season one where he's like, pivot, we need to pivot. They, they had a similar freak out. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Oh, that's oh, going to be I'm going to have to get. Oh, we're going to have to find that. <laughs> we're going to have to add that show notes for sure. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I, and I actually, um, that's one of the shows that's on my list from years ago that I never watched. What? Um, Silicon Valley. Oh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. 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 It's so. a great one. So Jenny, you're also a podcaster um, and you've yeah. been doing uh, pivot for how long now? I've well, I, I started writing it three years ago, and it comes out in September six is the official launch date. So it's really Yay. exciting to get it out from behind the computer and into the world. But you know, before you even started writing the book, like this has been your passion for quite a while. Oh what goodness. can you give us a little bit of your background and, yeah. and how you got sure. here? Sure. Absolutely. And I didn't have a name for it. So when I, I kind of co-opted Pivot from Silicon Valley, which is where I was born and raised, San Francisco and Palo Alto. Oh, nice. What kept happening was every two years or so, I felt like I was having a quarter life crisis. And as I ate, got older and older, and then I'm like, or is it a midlife crisis? And I just <laughs> thought, what the hell is wrong with me? There's either something seriously wrong with me that I'm never going to be happy in my career. I must be one of those entitled millennials the media keeps talking about. I was um, working at a startup. I left school early to work at a startup as the first employee. After two years, moved over to Google in training. I was doing AdWords product training. Two and a half years in, I hit a plateau. I pivoted internally to the career development team. And then after five and a half years at Google, I left to start my own coaching and consulting business. And I moved to New York. And sure enough, two years in, I my first book was called Life After College. And I didn't really want to talk about that for the next 10 years. And this time, this question, what's next? I didn't have a steady paycheck to fund that exploration. And it was incredibly stressful. In the start of 2014, which is not too long ago, mm -hmm. I seriously questioned if I needed to throw in the towel on my business and leave New York and go get a job. And my frustration with struggling with this question so much motivated me to find a better way. And as I started doing research for the book, I realized that I'm not the only one. Right. And everyone is experiencing this question much more frequently than in years past. So then I got kind of fed up about it. Like, well, then let's stop calling it a crisis. And a pivot is a totally normal thing. Career or business plateaus are a totally normal thing. And as to be expected, if you're someone that really cares about learning and growing and making an impact. And so now I took it on as my personal assignment to create a method that would help people be more efficient when they're asking what's next. So why do you think there's been, why do you think so many people are looking for the what's next? Do you like what, 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 what did you find in your research or your experience that, that would support that? It's happening by choice and by circumstance. I was truly shocked. There's a statistic that the average employee tenure in America is four to five years. When I interviewed people for Pivot and I went to fact check a year and a half later when the book was, we were almost done, I would say 90% had pivoted again. And not everyone by choice. In some cases, people were laid off. Their company was acquired. They were acquired and then fired. They lost their biggest client in their business. They tried to start a business and it failed. They realized entrepreneurship was or was not for them. So just about every single person had pivoted again. And I was, I was truly shocked to see that. So I think part of it is that people 
have realized in recent years that job security is an antiquated notion. I mean, it's mm. almost silly of me to even say that because we all feel it so viscerally. Right. But more than that, I think people have forfeited saying, you know what, money isn't everything. And I'm willing to make a change, even though it's difficult, because I want more for my life. And people are hungry at, at these days, I think, for real meaning and purpose. See, you know, it's interesting because when I was growing up, I'm in my um, mid, mid, I've been in my mid forties. You are. Um, I am. So when I was growing up, I mean, we talked a lot about like work ethic and having, you know, loyalty to your company. My dad was with his (laughs) company, you know, for 30 years. I mean, do you think that that kind of has fallen by the wayside and that the the importance that we put in, in, in loyalty, company loyalty is lost because companies aren't necessarily loyal to us or. Right. It's happening on both sides. And that's where. I definitely, and it was top of mind for me when I was writing this book, not to encourage reckless job hopping and no sense of commitment, whether it's to a job or a relationship, that it doesn't make anything better to just quit the second things get hard. But I do think that especially after 2008, when we saw such massive layoffs and companies consolidating and then not re-adding a lot of those jobs, because so much is getting automated and outsourced in this global economy that we're now in, that it was also that people realized my job might not be secure. And so on the one hand, yes, there's these younger generations that are more moving around more. And then I think we also see companies that are making changes. And and so I think this was a wake up call for people of all ages and all stages. When the 2008 kind of stuff started happening, I think everybody opened their eyes and said, oh, I might not be able to just rest invest right. for the next 30 years. Do you think, um, as far as your approach, and I, and I definitely want to get further into how you approach this, but how does it look when it comes to somebody who wants to pivot, um, you know, by choice versus somebody who's like, what's next because they've been, they feel like they've been put in this situation? Does it look the same or do you kind of approach it differently? You know, when we get better at pivot as a mindset, and an ongoing process, not just a one-time thing. I do think that the pivot points are less sharp and it's less jarring if we get pivoted, like losing a big client or Mm. getting laid off. There are ways to become more agile and that's one of the big things I talk about in the book. But to answer your question, let's say someone's not already in this mode, usually if you get pivoted, let's say you get laid off or even go through a divorce or have some huge life change that sparks a lot of other changes, for for in those cases, there's sometimes more of a reckoning process. Uh, what I, I, I unfortunately for space had to cut a whole part of the book that I called "Surf the Void," that was about how do you just deal with the feeling of emptiness or uncertainty that just transcends upon you like a cloud and and seems to follow you around. So there's some processing that happens, but then at a certain point, whether by choice or circumstance, it's now what am I going to do about it? Right. And and the biggest mistake that I made and that I see other people making is one taking it personally that they're at a pivot point. Like there's something wrong with me. Mm. Why, why don't I know what's next or why is this happening again or right now? And then two focusing so much on what's not working that, that a real, a great pivot is a methodical shift in a new related direction that leverages one's existing strengths. And so the biggest mistake is looking too far outside of yourself for answers. That everyone listening to this right now, you already have what it takes. You already have the skills, strengths, interests. It's not to say you won't go learn new things or meet new people, but that you're not starting from scratch. Right. So, I, Jackie, don't take this the wrong way, but Jackie's always pivoting. <laughs> um, they, but, some people call it ADD. Yeah. <laughs> I have no, friends like that. Yeah. yeah but no, I, I'm saying this because Jackie and I, you know, we talk a lot about like where we are in our life and, and wanting to be in different places. And I have consistently said that like I have visions for myself, but because I feel beholden to my mortgage and because I'm a single parent, um, you know, I don't have a backup plan in the sense that I don't have a, a partner that is able to say, you know what? Kim, I'll handle things. It's going to be tight. Go pivot, you know, go uh, adjust. Um, And so I, I feel like I'm always making excuses for not being able to do the, you know, to find the, my inner joy, like you were just suggesting. So what do you, can you speak to that at all? That like sometimes when you're stuck, you know, and it's, it's, you don't have stuck by responsibility. Yeah. Stuck by responsibility. Finances play a huge role. There's a whole chapter in the book on 
pivot finances because they, when we're talking about career change and not just like changing your mindset, you know, like some, some personal development stuff is all happening on the inside, but a pivot ha- costs money. And I don't want to uh, sidestep that fact. And so pivot, I call it pivot runway. It's how much runway do you have to make this change? And so it may be the case that yes, absolutely it affects a pivot if you're the primary breadwinner or you have a mortgage or even if your risk tolerance is slightly different. Right. So the questions are, and and there's a diagram, I call it the riskometer, that uh, what usually, so when we're talking about a pivot, there's your comfort zone. It's kind of like, yeah, life's good or works fine. The stagnation zone, if you're kind of get at a pivot point and maybe some in some cases, if you don't admit to yourself you start to fall more and more into that stagnation zone or even getting sick or physical mm. wax upside the head start happening. And then there's the stretch zone. That's the ideal range for change. And then there's the panic zone. So if you are the primary breadwinner and the thought of pivoting tomorrow, like making some drastic move, it's probably too sharp if it sends you into your panic zone. So the question is, okay, well, what are my constraints and what would be in my stretch zone so that I don't feel stagnant? But that honors my values, my risk threshold, and my very real bank account. Right. Well, let's talk about that stretch zone. It sounds, first of all, lovely, like a yoga (laughs) class. Um, But but how do you how do you get there um, practically? You know, if you're in one of these other zones. One one is to self assess first and foremost, and then everyone listening can kind of ask, where am I right now? Even and. So if you're not currently in your stretch zone, and the real crux of the pivot method, it's this four-stage process, but, uh, and so real briefly, because it kind of speaks to this, I think like a basketball player, they have one foot firmly grounded. When they stop dribbling, the plant foot, it's rooted, you're, it's stable. That's your existing strengths, interests, and experiences. Then they can scan for opportunity with their pivot foot. So that's the second stage, scanning for people and skills. The third is pilot, run small experiments. Don't worry about going all in on something overnight. That's too much pressure. And you can repeat plant scan pilot over and over until you're ready to launch if there is such a moment. And so when you mentioned that Kim is, you know, or people who are always pivoting, in some cases, it's that they're always piloting. They're always experimenting, but right. they're doing that within their current container of strengths and interests. So part of the stretch zone is looking for <laughs> Jackie's experiments. pointing at herself going, that's me, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's a way to stay really agile because if you're always kind of um, having fun with the experiment, you don't put any pressure on one. I think of them like, here's another metaphor, racehorses at the starting gate. You don't know which pilot is going to take off, but one of them will sort of take the lead. Oh, now with the Olympics, we could go with swimmers at the Olympics, <laughs> you know? Right. right. And um, – let and a good a good pilot will test three E's. One, do I enjoy this? Two, can I become an expert at it? And do I want to? And three is a room to expand, either in the market or within my business, within my company. And so part of getting into the stretch zone is saying, what experiments can I run that will help me test those three E's and see if I then want to invest even more in them? I love that. And the thing is, like, I, I think it's really important that people understand and you've said this so clearly. So I don't I don't know if I need to repeat it. But, you know, when Kim talks about my constantly pivoting, I, I don't go from working in television or podcasting or whatever it is I'm doing to wanting to be a, an accountant. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't look right. for opportunities and things to do that have absolutely nothing to do with what I'm already doing. You know, I that mean, is such a critical point. We can't say it enough because the the most common thing I see is people hit a pivot point and they go, okay, I'm at a pivot point. What's out there? And they immediately start looking outside of themselves. And that leads to compare and despair or analysis paralysis. And so you have to start from what you already have. Like, I mean, you don't have to, but if you want to save yourself a lot of angst and heartache, it's to look at where that plant foot is like, where am I right now? What do I know? And what, what does success look like a year from now? Even if you don't know all the specifics, those become such anchoring points to then direct the scanning. Usually we jump straight into problem solving without really inventorying. 
I don't, I think I just made that a verb, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that, you know what, that, you fit right in then here because yeah. we, we make everything <laughs> verbs. You're good. <laughs> Perfect. And I'm sorry for flipping the Kevin and Jackie on the, oh, that's okay. Oh, you're, you're good. <laughs> We're interchangeable. <laughs> on the, on the pivoting now. We're both pale redheads is really, it's really. <laughs> um, and by the way, I did, I did create a pivotability index. It's a 38 question self assessment. It takes less than five minutes. So uh, it's not even out yet. But if you're listeners, if you want to take the beta, there's three pivot profiles and people can kind of see where they fall. Oh, that's and, awesome. Uh, so I'm happy to send that to you for the show notes. Okay. Yes, I just, please. as an aside, I, you come up with these awesome phrases. Like, I'm, I'm loving this. Like, I, I, everything rhymes. Yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> Oh my gosh, half of them I'm just making up right now. But oh my god, it's brilliant! I, I was like, God, it's so good. Yeah, sorry, I'm like, I need to count them up. Yeah, but I love. I want to go back a little bit. Um, we have our questions, but everything that you say makes us come up with like tons more questions and, and forget what we had originally. So, um, run small experiments because you know I tend to be pivoting all the time, and this is why I think Kim and I work well together because she's like, no, I'm not going to even look at that because I'm stubborn I have... is what she's <laughs> no, but saying. she she has so much going on with you know advocacy and and her job as an executive director of the youth project and her or you know speaking and and this show and so I come up with like oh and we can now do this and blah 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 and she kind of shuts down because she's like I can't add that but if you you like my impression of you wasn't that awesome (laughs) um but run small experiments like it doesn't have to be all or nothing I'm a very all or nothing kind of person so I'm learning from you that that's not necessarily ideal so how Take do you it down those, a notch. How do you bridge those two worlds? Yeah. Yes. One is to catch, there's even a section I talk about all or nothing thinking or if then linear thinking. Only if I can go all in with this, then I'll do it. Or only if I can pay 10 grand for a branded website, then I'll launch my business. Well, technically you can launch a business, let's say a coaching practice with no website. Technically, you mm-hmm. know, you can email right. friends and family. So... One is just to catch it when it's happening. And then two, I like to ask, I call them combinatorial questions. So how can I try this new idea without betting the farm on it? Or, you know, even that's framing like the two things are against each other. So I would say, how can I test this new area and ensure that it's financially viable or whatever the values are around trying this thing? Or how can I pilot this new thing in a really lean and scrappy way? And to just ask the question that the answers will start to come. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself pointing to me, um, (laughs) constantly saying, I think this is just a counseling session. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) No, but like, I I won't explain what the, what the concept was, but Jackie came up with the, what is a great idea yesterday to do something. (laughs) And I really, we, we've, this is like, you know, Jackie and I have a marriage here, um, wanting to support and encourage, but also I'm the level headed, stubborn not level-headed that jackie's not but like oh yeah no you're, th- you're um, yeah okay so i know exactly what yeah and i and i my my answer was oh, wait like i i texted her a bitmoji of me like on the fetal position <laughs> on the ground and that was the <laughs> best way that i could <laughs> carefully say are you effing nuts <laughs> um but it's a great idea it's a great idea but you know if i'm the one that's always saying no and Jackie's mm. always wanting to do yes. I think I think this is where you, what you're what you're suggesting about these small experiments and like you know what is the value that you're placing on. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck because you don't know how to place value on something that you've never done and know what the risk is in accomplishing it. And I think oh, that's a good question. I, I think that's my yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, so here's, yeah, here's yeah. Not knowing example. how much effort should you put in, not knowing what the result is. Right. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> yes. Is, isn't this a, isn't this a life question? Like even yeah. in relationships, like how much effort am I going to give this new thing? I, right. So what one thing that you're describing is okay. Shiny new idea is on the table, and for Not Jackie, shiny. it's uh, uh, wait. Did I get? I yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally really got it right. Jackie's totally. shiny. Yeah. Jackie's, Jackie's shiny. Jackie. Kim is dull. It's yeah. We got it. Exciting. <laughs> it's super exciting and stretchy and edgy and awesome. It's just that perfect sweet spot. And then for Kim, it's a little bit of a panic zone, like fetal position emoji happening. Right. And so the question is for you, Kim. So okay, is there a scenario? Is there a smaller version that you'd be on board to pilot or even to? you know, what, what would bring it into your stretch zone for you? And then the, or is it that Jackie could take it and run with it for a little bit, 
gather more data and bring it back to you with more data. So whatever it would be that would help bring it into the stretch zone for you, I think that's a question to ask. If it's truly nothing about this will be in my stretch zone yet, it's identifying well, what will those ingredients be um, or, yeah, how can we make it even more accessible? Just so and you then, know, Jenny, Jackie yeah. is already repositioning her idea as we're talking and trying to convince me while you're talking. She literally is like, well, we could just do it in here. So I this, is what I'm trying to, this, this is what I'm talking about. I can't, I can't catch a break over here. She makes it sound like I'm talking over you, Jenny. I am not. She's just I mouthing just it. I just gestured at this room oh. with my hands. I'm picturing an awesome like back of the napkin sketch that you just pass across the table. And you're like, this, this. Yeah. Um, no. I just used I just used my hand to show her that I was like we could do it here. No, but but I but okay, continue your thoughts. Sorry, I totally interrupted you. (laughs) Yes, because that's that's where we are. Where I'm like the world, there's no limit, and she's like there are limits. Be realistic. So, but I but I think that's I I think that's what I'm guess what I'm getting from what you're saying though is that you that you can be idealistic and have these great visions, but there does need to you do need to apply some you know, reality. Yeah, totally. Here's where I think setting a vision can help as well, because it's also the difference and tactics. So Jackie's idea is maybe one means to some end. I'm not sure what the end is, but (laughs) I would ask, okay, if this goes, if you knock it out of the park with what is happening? What does success look like? And if both of you have a shared vision, so let's say if it's for the podcast, where do we want this thing in six months or in one year? What does success look like? How do we want to feel? What's our ideal average day? What's our partnership looking like? Even if you've already done this, you can always recalibrate and do it again. And then we say, okay, now here's one way to get there. There's this idea, uh, one tactic. What are the other ways? Do we want to brainstorm? You know, Is this the one we want to run with next? But that you know why you're doing it and what success looks like. Mm. And that might also inform how it fits into the broader scope of what you're doing. Because then you can ask, well, if we're going to take this on, maybe Kim wants to know, like, (laughs) if we're going to take this on, what else can we drop or delegate? What I want to get rid of something else so I don't feel overwhelmed. (laughs) And I think the drop or delegate or systematize is a really good question. Because sometimes if you can get that stuff off, there's more room for the new thing. Yeah. Right. And I think that's, oh, she's all like, <laughs> she's all like, Jenny's on my side. You're hired, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think that that's very relatable for all, all of those in our audience. But what I like, um, I want to go back to one of these questions that, that I like that your book isn't just for people who are in the middle of a pivot or wanting to pivot. Like this book is actually, I feel like for everyone in preparation for maybe, maybe, pivoting in the future by choice, but also just kind of, hey, we don't know what's going to happen. So why don't we yeah. read this, have this education, have this plan, you know, not necessarily looking for change today, but not being blindsided. And I love that. Well, thank you. You've just captured the whole thing in one in one sentence. That's it. The big secret is that pivot is a state of mind. And you're absolutely right. And And my editor and I talked about this. We you know, I said, I don't want this book just to be for people who are in a crisis and it's one and done. This is actually, and the I was so f- grateful to have Dan Pink do the cover blurb. He says, pivot is a book you will turn to again and again. And it's kind of play on words with turn. But that when startups talk about pivoting, it's usually plan B, something failed and now they need to pivot to save the business. But in our career, Pivot is plan A. And the more that we can be asking these questions, setting a vision, experimenting, looking at what's already working, and we do that continuously, the pivot points are less sharp. And it's actually more of a flow. And you can learn to go with the flow of life rather than being blindsided, exactly as you said, by pivot points that we don't see coming. Right. And I think that for those people who are living their life and they're, you know, taking the same path and expecting to take the same path and not able to kind of have an open mind to the fact that the path may not go in the direction that you're always expecting, um, then they're setting themselves up for failure, disappointment, depression, all of that. Like I think that in life, the, the ability to pivot by choice or otherwise is actually kind of the exhilarating part. 
You know, yes. like I, I, I'm a freelance, you know, outside of the show, I'm a freelance creative. So every job that I take is, is potentially my last job. If you ask me, <laughs> what if no one ever hires me again? But yet suddenly, you know, there's always something else. But, you know, I, I'm working on a conference right now. I've never worked on a conference before, but I'm using skills that I, I have and that I've used. And that when they reached out and they asked me to work on this conference, I'm like, that's exciting. You know, I get to do that yes. stuff, but also learn because I think once we stop learning in life, then that's when we get really, really stuck. Again, so it's so well said. Everything you just said is perfect because it's true. I'm a big advocate. I think, you know, my purpose in life, I want to be as helpful as possible to as many people as I can. But barring that, it's I want to be a cheerleader for fear, insecurity, and uncertainty. I think these things get a really bad rap. And especially in personal development, we talk about crush your fear or these like really aggressive sort of masculine things about like crushing it. Or I even hate the trope of like, and you have to love yourself before someone else can love you. Kind of. But how many of us (laughs) learned to love ourselves through another person or with another person? That's what I I say. (laughs) Yeah. So, so same thing around career change because career change can be, or business can be really nerve wracking because as we talked about, it's like if your livelihood or even part of your family depends on you for it, it's terrifying. So if you feel you being anyone listening, fearful, insecure, unsure, welcome, welcome to the club. Like there's just nothing wrong with you and celebrate those things because it means that you are learning and growing and that deep down, that's what we all want. And Joseph Campbell calls it the rapture of being alive. Huh. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I am fairly insecure with a lot of things despite successes that I have. I do have fear and fear is usually a motivator for me, but then there's something else that'll like block it, you know, and, and, and it sounds like it's the insecurity maybe of in what Jackie and I've talked a lot about too is the fear of being successful and what mm-hmm. success looks like because when you've been hit mm-hmm. with a lot of you know, negative things. It's like, can't even visualize what it would be to not have it, you know, and to have to wake up and be like, this is a great day as opposed to eh, today's another day, you know? And so I, 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 for me, I know that I get in my own way sometimes because the, what, what looks like success is scary. And it's like, I've never really entirely had that. So eh, I'm good here. And my mediocre, mediocrity, my mediocreness, <laughs> that's the word. Um, but I think that, you know, the fear and, and insecurity, I think is so realistic that like you said, that there's such a negative connotation added to it, that it, it, it can be debilitating if you can't channel that and use that to be empowered by it. Yeah. And, and on the success thing, I call them success demons that for me, what I've noticed, I was really, when I was going through my last pivot, what I described, I just couldn't even handle it. I mean, I was like, I, I don't know. I'm, I give up. I actually gave up on trying to be happy. And I just said, please just let me have some sense of equanimity. But I, I, I give up. I, I don't know how to try and be happy anymore. Reading the book Outrageous Openness, by the way, I absolutely loved it. It's all about turning things over when you say, you know what? Yeah, I throw my hands up. I turn this over to you. Universe, divine, super God, ever you want to call that higher force if there is one, if you, you listening, believe that. Uh, and that's like a huge relief. But also, uh, so for me, the success demons are, when is the other shoe going to drop? If oh, I felt happy for too many days in a row, oh, I'm feeling joyful. When's the other shoe going to drop? And right. now I just know, or when am I going to die? Like sometimes if I book a <laughs> flight to an exciting place like Bali, I'll think, what if I die before I get there or I come home? Some weird thing. What if I die before my book comes out? I actually told my editor, Natalie, uh, hey, if I die, can you just make sure that Pivot comes out? And then <laughs> please just, those are my wishes. And my brother will help get whatever needs to be done to the finish line. And I realized that they come in for me when something I really care about is at Mm. stake or something big. And so part of taking the sting out of them, I think, is recognizing, oh, this means I'm really doing something. I'm really putting myself out there. Right. Wow. That that's and that's awesome that you um, think like a crazy person like we do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, um, I can relate to all of it. Right, yeah. right. But, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to get personal a little bit with Kim. I already, we, I, creatives, we do any of this if we didn't have some inner, inner neuroses. Seriously. You know, it's like a create. That's what art is. 
Okay. It's continue. so true. It's so true. So, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but when Kim was in college, her brother was murdered and she, her life completely took a pivot that she uh, was not planning. And I have, I've been friends with you for what, like seven years now. Yeah. And she often gets very fearful with the idea of success because, you know, she does a lot of, a lot of amazing work based on wh- how her life took this pivot without her consent, right? So she speaks to victims. She speaks uh, at conferences. She works with teens, which you were headed in that direction anyway, like helping people. But I, I often see, because there are so many people who are like, we want to do this show with you and we want to do this with you and we want to do that with you. And then it gets, she, you know, in the past would get excited and then things wouldn't work out. You know, I, I think that if somebody goes through pivot, a pivot, due to trauma and that their life mm. kind of becomes all about that. Um, it's really tough to, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? You're the <laughs> well, expert here. First, Kim, I'm so sorry to hear that. I can't, I cannot even begin to imagine how traumatic that must have been. And that that is the kind of thing that that's, that is trauma. You know, that's, that's crisis. That's the sky. And people can choose to pay of it kind of after processing that or sometimes you have to do it when you're in the midst you're such a beautiful example of transforming it you know I had a friend say to me it's like we don't choose we can't choose what happens to us but we can transform it and it's just beautiful to see how you that are doing that and that so often it, it is our challenges that become our purpose and our service and it's for some reason, we go through that and then we would never wish it upon ourselves or a loved one. And yet it becomes such a rich uh, Khalil Gibran. One of my favorite lines of his is the deeper the sadness carves into your being, the more joy your cup can hold. Right. And I find that really um, I kind of remind myself of that when, when things happen. But how is it, how, you know, how is one able to, you know, the work she's doing is so amazing, but you know, she didn't choose this. So when she tries to, what people will look and say, oh, you're trying to capitalize on something or you're trying to, you know, um, how, how do you ride that balance? I, and I know this isn't necessarily what your book is about. You just, you're so insightful, you know, and oh, um, I mean, you know, how, I know it's very unique circumstances, but like if to, to break if it down, said that I would pull a Taylor Swift. I would just say, hey, here's gone. Hey, you know, like <laughs> that's ridiculous. And if anyone wants to just spew negativity or just cut something down like that, that like that gets me fired up for you, Kim, if that's ever happened. If it's just a fear that they're going to say that, okay, that's that's just a fear. And you, a lot of our fears are sort of paper tigers that are really dismantled once you're just out there and doing it. Um, but if but if people have said that, that to me is just absurd, and they have no right to to do that. And then, and then what are they creating in the world other than just cutting things down? Right. So I think, um, I think what Jackie is, is getting at or trying to get at is, is really more like when, when, when you're trying to pivot and people are encouraging your pivot and then it doesn't manifest itself into a successful pivot, when should you stop trying to pivot? (laughs) Okay. So that's actually, that is a different question. I would also say to the first part, there's kind of a (laughs) spiritual aspect of it, which is, um, I don't, it depends what someone's beliefs are, but I believe that there is a sense of Dharma or purpose and that we're called to that. And so, uh, yeah, sometimes life events happen that actually put us on the path. And sometimes I think about, you know, when I'm coaching, I'll ask someone, I didn't make this up, but if you're the main character in a movie, why did this happen to you, your character at this moment and in this exact way? What are you meant to learn and do from it? And we're all watching and we're cheering you on and this epic thing just happened. And and now what? And so that's, I think, a way that we can look at those situations to try and figure out what we're supposed to do with them. Right. Now to the question of how do you know when a pivot's not working? Yeah, I think we've all probably had that feeling of something is just not gaining traction. When something's meant to be, I like to say the universe rolls out the red carpet. Every step you take, there's just another magical thing and a person and serendipity is really working. And then usually when there is not that sense of flow, it typically means someone's not rooted well enough in their existing strengths. So whether that's what you're already 
good at, what you're interested in, who you know, what you've already been doing, or it's not truly aligned with your one-year vision. It may be the case that someone's following shoulds or trying to please other people or doing what society would deem successful, but not what they in their inner core believe. And this is where mindfulness practices have saved me. I know it's really cheesy to say like meditate. It's like saying eat your spinach or <laughs> go to Pilates. <laughs> but it does help because ultimately at the end of the day, so much of pivoting and so many of the people I interviewed said, I just knew. And it's a gut instinct. And so if something isn't working, you can ask this. And this I learned from Tosha Silver, Outrageous Openness as well, which is please just show me the next step. So when you're really stuck, it's what is the next step? And whether that's your inner wisdom telling you or you kind of have a higher thing that you connect to, the answer will come. And you don't have to know all the steps. That's why the subtitle, the only move that matters is your next one. Mm -hmm. That could even be applied on a week to week basis. Right. Well, uh, we only have a couple of minutes um, left. And I know that, you know, Kim's situation is quite unique. But, you know, if we were going to break it down for, I don't want to say your average broad, but, you know, like, let's call her Kate. And she, <laughs> you know, is in a career. She's got a couple of kids. Um, she's 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 done very well, but she realizes that that's not um, the fulfillment, you know, that she she wants to kind of shift into maybe a more um, flexible or, or something. What are some practical first steps for somebody who desires a pivot but doesn't even know I mean other than buying your book that's number one which you can uh, <laughs> that's a great one well and you can go to broadscast.com and pre-order it already we have the um the link up yes. so um but and if if you do that there's a whole toolkit you'll get access right away and there's 30 t- t- templates that I've created one of them is the ideal day Mad Lib. so whether you pre-order and use the template or you envision this for yourself Having a compelling vision is the number one thing that's going to fuel motivation, excitement, energy, and it's scary because as we talked about, the minute that you sit down and start to say, what do I really want? It's quite scary sometimes. Mm -hmm. So even if Kate doesn't know exactly where she wants to be working, in fact, it's too early to worry about how. How would I get there? How would I afford it? How is this possible? Am I too old, too young, too this, too that. Now is not the time to ask how. The question is, a year from now, what would I be thrilled to have happening in my life? So Kate might say something like, I'm working part-time at a job that I love or a remote work agreement or I've started my own business. I wake up and describe the whole day. How do you feel? What type of stuff are you doing? Who are you connecting with? What have you become an expert in? What are people coming to you for? Just as much detail as you can. That vision, like you, I I work with a lot of people. Like I love how you said there's no average broad. It's true. No one listening (laughs) to this is average. There's no. It's like a contradiction in terms. Right. Same with the people I work with and wrote the book for. So what I find is they actually don't need my help when it comes to making things happen. That once they're clear on the vision, they're perfectly smart and resourceful and can actually make it happen in no time. So it's the clarity piece and the what you're working toward because most of us are so mired in what's not working and that's what we complain to family and friends about that we just don't stop to really build the vision. So I'd say that's that's everyone's homework from this call. That, wow. <laughs> that's fantastic. You are yeah. like, I'm going to the church of Jenny Blake now. So <laughs> <No>. <laughs> let me know what time I have to be there and what the, and I'll tie, I'll tie then everything. No. Um, <laughs> so well, um, I'm already in for the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So where can people find you? I know you're at Jenny underscore Blake on Twitter. Yes. Pivotmethod.com is where all the book resources are. And then and that's where you can find the Pivot Podcast. And then I also have a blog at JennyBlake.me. Awesome. awesome. And we just appreciate all of your expertise. And um, again, you could pre-order the book. We have a link to it um, right on our broadcast page. And when is your book available again? Tell us September, September 6th. Congratulations September 6th. on your pub date. Thank you that's so awesome. much. That's fantastic. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining us, Jenny. Jackie, Kim, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And big thanks to everybody for listening. Awesome. Well, we'll have a great weekend. So Jenny Blake, um, again, head over to 
broadscast.com. Uh, we have a post there and uh, you can pre-order her book, which, <sighs> you know, we are lucky enough that we got one, a copy. And yeah, I've been digging I know that it. I know that I'm going to be hit over the head. <laughs> <laughs> no, because mine has a bunch of, well, ours has a bunch of uh, <laughs> post-it notes in there. That's that was a little funny. Freudian slip right uh, there. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. just a quick reminder before we wrap things up that um, today's episode is brought to you by ebates.com. And as much as you hate hearing about uh, s- sponsors, uh, we ha- love talking about them because seriously, <laughs> we are not going to bring you um, products that we don't think bring some sort of value to your life. Well, and unless unless no, I'm just what? Kidding, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> unless they give us a really, really big yeah. check. Yeah, um, there's yeah. always that. But- I'm always willing to pivot for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I again, like we talk about Audible and we talk about um, Amazon Associates and the open box. Oh my right, gosh, right. those open box products where right. you save fifteen percent or Ebates and right. and you know these we we do pick and choose things that we think our broads will our broad squad. Um, yeah will find valuable. Right. Well, like I think, you know, um, bringing it back to, to Jenny for a second, you know, um, Jenny, Jenny from the block. Uh, (laughs) so I, I, you know what I, what I, I, I get nervous, you know, when you find people that, um, challenge you, challenge me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying that with with, with, uh, tongue in cheek that I think that, you know, I am, um, because I think that, uh, you know, we, we all can be resistant to change. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the comments that she made about fear and insecurity, because that spoke to me, mm-hmm. um, I think it is, it's really important to channel that and to, and to recognize that that's, that that could be part of your resistance plan. Um, and, you know, what you're willing to do to either stay in that or to, to, like I said, to harness that. And I think that there's something in this book, um, you know, when some of the things that she said today would be helpful and kind of moving it out of the way or, or using it to your, to your benefit, um, which I always, I never really saw it that way before. Right. You know, I touched, I attached something negative to it. Well, look at that. What? But I mean, just, you know, we're, we're, we're working here. We're working together here. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're trying to pull me over to your side. No, because I, you know what I, I will say, and you know, not that everybody else needs to hear about this, but you know, you're very, very good for me because I am like shiny. We could do this. And, right. you know, and I want to do it now and I want to do it and it's going to be bigger than ever. I'm, I'm very Donald Trump in that way. Right. It's gonna not that huge. it's going to be huge and it's going to happen fast and it's not going to be that much work. And I'm going to have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> right. See? I'm going to build a wall and Kim's going to have to pay for it. No, but it's going to be huge. It's going to be fast. It's going to be so much easier than you think. Right. You know, that's, and that's BS. Right. But that's where, you know, I think that, that just this like is where, you know, being single, I don't have to practice this very much in my life with, you know, how to realistically look at what somebody is suggesting to me and be able to use the brain that I feel like sometimes I'm brought into a project for, which is the mathematics of it, the logistics of it, the budget of it, you know, I mean, even in my job, like I, Mm. you know, we've joked about this, that my board of directors, they had these great ideas and there's 12 of them and they come in and they share these great ideas. And then I'm the one going, no, 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 maybe no, no, no. (laughs) Because in, in the real world, 11 of those ideas, which are fantastic, don't apply to the mission or to the project that we're working on. And so I have to really struggle. I struggle with how to support and encourage someone that has a great idea and a great vision with really what is the, the reasonability with, with being able to, to manifest it. And, and I find that with you that like, I, I feel like in my head, I'm like, Oh, I don't know. I I like the idea, but really like, what's it going to, is it time? Are we ready for that? Is it, it, does it bring us anything right now? Right, and, right. you know, the and, return and, on investment is huge because, yeah. you know, and it's talk- not me saying no, it's really, it, I mean, it sounds like it's me saying no, because <laughs> the words are you saying no, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. And I, and I think, but this is, you know, again, being that I don't always have to practice this in my relationships because I'm alone. Um, yes, Jackie, that's my way of saying I'm still single. Um, <laughs> it's hard to learn how to, how to, how to have that conversation and how to support someone's vision and their energy with something, but then also be the, the, the one that's squashing it because right. it doesn't necessarily. And I think a lot of people jive. can relate to that, whether it's a yeah. business partner or a friend or in a marriage, you right. know, they're, they're often, um, two people will come together in that way. Yeah. And like one is like, look what we could do. And right. I mean, that happens in my own marriage. I mean, we have three dogs. My husband wants zero, you know? Right. <laughs> and so he, like the, yesterday he was like, I just feel like things would be much easier without these dogs. And, 
they probably would, but you know what? We're here now. Right. <laughs> so Because I put us here. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, uh, but at the same time, sometimes in the past, he's tried to, like, he's, he's said, I'm going to say no to this. And then he's kind of changed his mind, um, maybe with a little encouragement. And then he's happy because... Um, he, he, you know, he stepped out of his comfort zone and it really worked out and it was something really right. enjoyable. But, but when you're in a situation that like, like you and I are, where, where you are clearly more the creative one between us and the one that has big ideas and, and vision and I'm clearly not. And so that's, that's where I think our relationship is, is beautiful. And then sometimes it gets it's stalled in a little yeah. bit, you know, because we're trying to figure out how to work together. And well, I love you, Kim Goldman. You got Jackie McDougal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, All that's right. your way of saying it's time to go. It is actually. We've yeah. got twenty seconds. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jenny Blake, um, for imparting your wisdom. Um, again, you can go to broadcast.com, pre-order the book, find us on all the social media channels, and we will talk to you next week. Happy so, Olympics! Thanks for listening. You're listening to Broadscast with Kim Goldman and Jackie McDougal. The most riveting hour of anything you've ever heard.